Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, as already mentioned, uh, please feel free to just jump in if you have any comments, uh, if you have any corrections to make. There will be a Q&A uh, afterwards, but uh, if there is just something that you want to, uh, uh, to comment on, please feel free to do so. My name is Kurt Kemmerer. Thank you for the invitation to speak here at the DeepSec conference in Vienna. I have brought with me a, an issue that all of us have read about and probably talk about quite a lot, the issue of cloud services and the notion that in an industrialized world, the only non-industrialized uh, segment of it is probably the IT world, at least many people look at it uh, like this. And uh, industrialization in other areas means uh, we have cars that work, we have cars that work much better quite often than IT does. And so it is only normal that people think about uh, the likes of uh, quality, availability, resilience uh, of an IT similar to that of their car. And that means uh, in an industrialized world, uh, it's obvious uh, if things are run from a huge IT factory up there in the cloud, then things should not only be easier, they should be much cheaper. And the notion of uh, electricity from the socket is quite similar to the notion of cloud services in IT industries. Uh, as you see from the first picture, uh, as we are just post-lunch, I thought uh, I give you, uh, I give you a not so uh, serious animal story, a tale about the cloud services, and uh, the provocative question: still too early for the cloud services to take off. Now, uh, I have a presentation for you with three uh, bullet points. Uh, I want to talk a bit uh, about the corporate IT animal story to date, so where does corporate IT stand, and that in relation to the tale I have for you. Uh, a little bit uh, dive into the cloud before talking about what will the cloud uh, services for corporate uh, IT customers will be from next year onwards. And uh, that said, I won't talk about the consumer experience at this point. Uh, my company is working for uh, corporates uh, most of the time, and uh, therefore it is on the corporate side of cloud services. Now, this is Frank, and Frank is the IT director of a company with the name of Jumping Horse. Jumping Horse is not in the IT business, but of course, like uh, everybody else, they are using IT to just get the job done. Frank uh, is a seasoned guy. He has been in IT for two decades, uh, he is, has been with Jumping Horse for well over one decade, uh, and it's a good run business, it works, and on Frank's side, he seasoned, uh, he has gone through so many hypes, uh, he has gone through so many Gartner curves, <laughs> you all know them, and uh, as you see, uh, as you look into the face of Frank, he's a smart guy, but you see on his nose, you see a couple of scars, and uh, you see the SOA scar, which is, uh, which is the, the, the most recent one. This is this scar. He has other car scars like that for business intelligence. He did BPO, business process outsourcing, quite a bit. He outsourced first only to insource later on. And uh, of course, he has done quite a bit of open source, tried things out. Uh, open source there to liberate him from the daily pain of his business, but uh, he has seen the limitations there. So there is not a lot of stories that Frank hasn't heard, and therefore whenever he hears something about a new gig, uh, be it SaaS, be it PaaS, be it cloud services, uh, he has already the Gartner curve in front of him. Now this is Frank, and uh, Frank's business is to run the IT of Jumping Horse. You see the IT is a, is a colorful thing. Uh, there are people who would call it a zoo, but let's call it colorful. 
And frankly speaking, in frank terms, it's not optimal, but it works. It has worked. He has never lost any single record of data in the last 10 years, which is quite a thing. And uh, he has to support legacy of some 20 years. His predecessor left over a couple of computers, an ERP system, uh, one of these early stage CRMs. He inherited quite a bit. And of course, he has been busy adding to this legacy. And today he has quite interesting a collection of applications and tools, of middleware, of databases, of computers and devices. And uh, these uh, devices and these gadgets, they have interdependencies that are simply there. Uh, he didn't plan for these interdependencies. They simply happened as release uh, 5.7 did things that 5.6 didn't do. He, he just adopted 5.7, but uh, 5.6 was the last release to support something uh, that uh, gave the parrot in this picture a piece of the banana. And uh, with 5.7, uh, the ape, as you see it from the picture, continues to own the banana, but this time without being able to interact with the parrot. This is just the situation as in every good run IT shop in a corporate IT. Nothing special about it. Now, Frank's experience is uh, I get by with a little help from my friends. This is how it has always worked in traditional IT. And with a little help from my friends, uh, you see the two guys. Uh, one of the guys is, uh, is a vendor of hardware and software, and the one to the right, he's playing around with the tools. He makes the stuff work. He does what is, what is a huge business called system integration. And uh, he is from a big consulting or system integration firm. And these are the two guys, or uh, the representatives of the two guys, who make the job work. Uh, if you look at big consulting firms today, uh, there are, in Europe alone, there are 10 consulting firms that have more than 50,000 people each. So there is quite some help that uh, Frank has. But uh, what Frank has also experienced is that the guy to the right is professional services driven. He likes to be paid by the day even better by the hour. Uh, the other guy to his left, he wants to be paid uh, by the product that he ships, period. This is the world that Frank has been living on in for some 20 years. And uh, the world of IT projects and solutions, that world requires quite an awful lot of uh, best of breed projects that uh, require best of breed resources. Now, best of breed uh, has been invented uh, just to more or less hide the fact that it's outrageously expensive to take a couple uh, of software tools, put them together in a solution, and make them work in an organization. Now, if there are things that are, that are so outrageously expensive and difficult to maintain, obviously, there is a lot of interaction that needs to take place. And that takes time. It costs a lot. And by the end of the day, you end up with one of a kind. Now, Jumping Horse Inc. has best of breed projects all over the place. They did a best of breed data warehouse. They did a, a best of breed integration ERP CRM. It's all best of breeds, but uh, what they ended up with is what we have seen beforehand, and it's one of a kind. And that is the question I would want to raise at this point, whether one of a kind still makes sense uh, in the world we are living in, and in particular, as Jumping Horse is not an IT firm. They do something else. It's not their job to have the most sophisticated IT. It's their job to help the customers in a way that is unique. The uniqueness has to come from 
the way they work with their customers and not the way they do their IT. But this is just to explain where they come from. Now, this is Frank's nightmare. Frank's nightmare is that riding horse, uh, uh, jumping horse is, uh, is riding horse, and uh, it's not the other way around, the way it should be, that uh, the guys who come in to give you some help, help you out. It's instead uh, limiting your own capabilities if they sit on your back and uh, simply do best of breed uh, projects and solutions for so long. Now, this is a situation that uh, Frank has experienced and he's waking up in the middle of the night to just have this, from his point of view, quite ugly picture in front of him. Now, how does IT contribute to jumping horses core business? This is the question he's asking himself. It's not clear whether it does, uh, at least he's being challenged on a daily basis, and uh, where it does, it's not clear whether that couldn't be done differently. This is what uh, his, his most nightmarish dream is all about, and coming back to the core uh, business they run, IT is only a support process to that core business. Uh, IT doesn't have uh, a life in its own right. IT uh, should only make a living, this is what he is being told by his colleagues, uh, by supporting the core process that may be uh, selling horse saddles if a uh, jumping horse was in that business. Now, uh, he's mired in daily business, so uh, literally uh, the Franks of our world, uh, there may be migration projects that, uh, that require Frank to be in his shop not only for 24 hours, but he may not see his wife and his kids for two weeks. This is simply how it has worked, and that means mired in daily business doesn't allow you to think uh, about the next stage that you should get to. And in his case, uh, he can certainly say a jumping horse is not ready for takeoff, and I mean takeoff into a world that is less sophisticated, uh, or no, complicated, I should say, that, it, that can be sophisticated, but is less complicated for the business he works in. What if partnerships made in heaven turn sour? This is what is happening on a, on a daily basis, that uh, the initial partnerships, you saw the bear who said, I love you, uh, suddenly grows up, and uh, with this uh, sudden situation, uh, value creation can, mean different, can have different meanings to different animals. What do I mean? There is a software vendor who talks about license fees all the time. There is another software vendor who talks about maintenance fees. If you read uh, the, the, the news, the business news, uh, then you read that certain software vendors have uh, trouble with their customers who do not want to continue to pay 20 plus percent on an annual basis just for them to pick up the phone. So uh, what has happened on the other end is that the Franks of uh, this world have more or less found that uh, there are certain indecent practices in the software industry in particular that uh, they should deal with. So. Uh, if partnerships are not what they were in the past, the key question that Frank has to ask himself, can jumping horse jump ship? That said, uh, he doesn't know for sure, but this is when some help kicks in for Frank. Now, the help he gets, he gets from his CFO. His CFO is a guy with the name of Bill. So you look into his face, you see he's straight. So he, he's a no BS person. He's straight and uh, Bill will, uh, will tell Frank when it's time to talk. Frank, we have to talk is what nowadays in 2009 he says to Frank, uh, Frank, we have to talk means I have to pay the bills even in times of crisis. As uh, you can again read from the corporate news, it's not uh, the year 
uh, that uh, was there in 2008 and 2007, it's different. So Bill's job is to talk to the guys in the company and ask them for their contribution to the future success of the business. And as Bill has uh, to pay the bills, and as you look into his face, he does pay the bills, he will make sure he can. Then he tells Frank, no CapEx anymore. So for you who may not be familiar with the, the CapEx term, capital expenditures means, uh, this is what in the past an IT director always had, he had a pot of cash and if uh, a traditional software vendor, a hardware vendor and so on came by and said, I need some of this cash because I ship you 10 computers, I ship you uh, another 2,000 ERP licenses, then uh, that was a capital expenditure. That means uh, the company signed the dotted line, maybe Bill himself or Frank, and upon signing the dotted line, uh, the guys received uh, a decent chunk out of this pot of cash. That was capital expenditure. And Bill says no CapEx anymore. That means uh, not only I don't want it anymore, but uh, I don't have the money. So I know of quite a few CIOs and CFOs who don't have any money to spend on capital expenditures for IT this year and the coming year. So. That is new with the crisis. That means if there is a structural change going on, the crisis is accelerating that change because Bill also says, if I pay some, then it's only operational expenses. That means uh, the guy who previously drove up to, uh, to Jumping Horse uh, with a truckload of shrink-wrapped software or a truckload of new computers, he has to live with another model. I don't pay him uh, by uh, the license of a shrink wrap software, I pay him on value creation and that is operational expenses. I can pay five bucks a month, I can pay, pay 20 bucks a month, but uh, that is uh, much easier for me as a CFO to run with because I have to pay other bills for our core business. Now this is Bill and this is Hank. Hank is the CEO of Jumping Horse Inc. Hank is a serious guy. Hank uh, tells everybody who wants to hear it and not wants to hear it, we have no nonsense years in front of us. Now, what does he mean by that? He knows what customers want and his customers have a similar attitude to what you, uh, what you start realizing is increasingly the attitude of IT directors. They want more for less. Now, he's IT savvy at the same time. He buys books from Amazon. And the Amazon uh, people or friend of his who also buys from Amazon, they told him, listen, uh, listen Hank, you can host the stuff uh, on Amazon. First, he didn't want to believe it, and, uh, uh, but uh, the, idea, uh, the idea is quite an intriguing one. And so uh, he has it for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is uh, Hank, uh, Hank uh, he's, not, he's not the guy who is easily afraid of things, but he has to simply live with the world as it is. So he's on the leash shareholders shareholders who he may have asked for money over and over again. Again, like the banks uh, did ask their shareholders for an increase in capital. So uh, Hank is a nice guy, uh, but not always, as you see, and uh, that has to do with the limitations he has to live in. Now this is Hank. Hank's point was, why own a zoo if the only thing we need is access to animals. That was Hank's point after having talked to his Amazon colleagues and uh, heard the ideas, why don't, don't you put your stuff on Amazon? This is uh, what he was uh, thinking and he was, he was uh, articulating it in 
such a way? Why not donate our zoo to Amazon and simply visit it? Of course, Hank is not an IT guy, but uh, the idea is crystal clear. And that means any time we want. I don't want this uh, ERP thing. Uh, ERP may be different, but a couple of other software tools, I don't want to own them. What if we gave them away to somebody else who takes care of the animals, who feeds them, who makes sure once we show up, uh, they are uh, nice and uh, ready uh, for us anytime we want, as we need it, and as agreed with the individual animal. So uh, he was, he is already going one uh, idea further, and that is not the idea of giving away the zoo to Amazon, but uh, of uh, having a more granular approach. Uh, you could call it web service style, if uh, you were talking to Frank. Why not working with the animals on an individual basis? This is Hank. So Frank, having listened to what Hank says, uh, he's scared to death. A zoo can be a real home if wild wilderness is the only scary option. So what he tells Hank, listen, Hank, uh, we have a zoo here, or you may call it a prison, but uh, it's always a cozy environment. Uh, we have electricity. Uh, we have never lost uh, one piece of data. So what do you want to give up uh, if you don't know what is coming? As you may read, uh, this, is a, this is a movie ad, don't go to the woods today. And uh, he has quite a few arguments. So Frank's arguments are, uh, what if there's a, a DOS attack? If there is data leakage, and he has a couple of uh, newspaper articles he can easily present to Hank. Uh, what if there is an outage? Even Google had outages. What if the guys don't store? He can come up with a very prominent article that was in the news several weeks ago. Uh, it's one of the top three uh, IT companies in the world that managed to lose data of their customers. That's serious. He has never lost any, and he couldn't afford to do so. So that's a real challenge. And uh, then uh, the important question for him, uh, he will never be able to switch off the old IT on Friday night, only to switch on the new IT, the cloud IT, on Monday morning. It cannot work. He's, he will need a transition period of 10 plus years, and he will always have certain things on premise while others may reside in the cloud. But the question he's asking himself and his CEO, Hank, how can zoo and wildlife coexist in a hybrid world? These are the questions he has. And now he is ready for a deep dive into uh, cloud IT. Now, how does the deep dive look like? This is. This is uh, Frank in disguise. So uh, you see he's, he has gotten serious about uh, cloud computing, but he, he wants to have a deep dive. He doesn't want to have the marketing messages, uh, the marketing message that, messages that all starts with, believe me. He wants to do a deep dive. Now, uh, he tells Hank, let me do a deep dive before we try to take off, because uh, he can show him the SOA scar, he can show him the BI scar, he can show him uh, the BPO scar, all scars that have to do with acronyms, uh, IT acronyms, and why shouldn't he have a, a SAS scar and a cloud scar, and maybe if he has bad luck, uh, the, the SAS uh, scar would even take his nose away. So uh, there is real reason for Hank, uh, for Hank to give uh, Frank the yes, uh, please do a deep dive. And uh, what uh, Frank uh, has looked at is he has experienced the old lock-in situation. That means once you sign the dotted line with, an, with a traditional IT vendor, he more or less owns you for 20 years to come, depending on what you buy. If you buy a database 
it's quite likely that he owns you for 10 years. If you buy an ERP system, it's quite likely he will own you for 20 years. So he wants to avoid this locking situation. That means uh, people would like to, to enter a house, an unknown house, uh, if they know if I do a step into the house, I have a 100% guarantee to be able to walk. So a very serious exit option is, he, is what he's looking for. What he's also uh, looking for is uh, this uh, notion of private cloud, public cloud. There are things that you can and should do in a public cloud, like email. You can do it uh, if certain things are well done. Why not? It's an infrastructural service. There are others like uh, an ERP, if you have a sophisticated business that you run, probably you would want to run them either uh, still on your legacy or in a what nowadays is called private cloud. That means I store the stuff, I run it, and I'm in control of my business. So that he wants to understand. And he also wants to understand how his his, his world that he cannot, he cannot terminate uh, the IT department on Friday night, I said. He cannot close down all his computers. He uh, cannot migrate to anything. He will have to run a hybrid model with the stuff that he has without uh, growing that and the new stuff and that he can grow over time. So this is what uh, he found out on his deep dive and now what is the key to the solution that he has found? And the key to the solution is the power of all in one boat. Now what do I mean by that? Cloud computing is about uh, instant gratification. You provide them a service, they pay for it, done deal. That is instant gratification. For Frank, uh, the instant gratification equation is a good one because he knows once it's terminated, it's done. This is on demand. On demand can be on and off and on and off. That is what he would want. And then he would want to leverage the economies of scale that uh, the Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, etc., like companies have. If they build a uh, huge infrastructure in the cloud, then this is economies of scale that uh, he wants to leverage and he wants to work against SLAs. He wants to have a guarantee that he's always on whenever he wants, that there is a guy at the other end of the cloud who picks up the phone if he runs into trouble, and he wants to have this exit option. Now, the key to all of this is the power of all in one boat, and, and that has to do with economics. Today's economics are, if you, if you look into SAP's or Oracle's, I, IBM's, not so, Microsoft's, th those three balance sheets and profit and loss statements, and they do it four times a year. Then what is most important is the license revenue. This is the capital expenditure. I come by uh, my customer, he throws a ton of cash over the wall into my uh, pocket and this shows up as, as, a, as a profit on the balance sheet, on the profit and loss statement of the traditional software companies. And this is what they would want to maintain because uh, it's an easy life. You collect cash first, and you promise that over the next couple of years, you are going to be a good partner. This is the promise. So uh, this is to the detriment of Frank because, uh, and of Bill, because they spend the money right now, and the only thing they get is the promise that in the next, next couple of years, it will work. And in order to be allowed to get fulfillment on that promise, they have to uh, throw up some 20% of the initial license fee payment on an annual basis. So that is certainly not what Bill and Frank have in mind. They have in mind 
the power of all in one boat. That means uh, risk sharing and through risk sharing, risk mitigation. If the boat is about to go under, everyone is responsible. In today's world, if the software doesn't work, responsible is Frank. He could go to Bill and ask him to send a letter to the software company, but there is not a lot that will happen. In a pay-as-you-go model, once it doesn't work, there is no payment. Imagine a world where uh, the Microsofts, the Oracles, the SAPs wouldn't be paid for one full day because their, their service wouldn't be running and delivering the value that they promised they would deliver. So it's a much better situation for, uh, for uh, jumping horse and it is uh, equally uh, good, of course, for for uh, a Bill and a Frank who are working uh, with their partners and it's good for the partners because uh, this does socialize the environment. Partners who know that you are sitting in one boat uh, with your customers, they behave differently. They add new services on a, on a daily basis. Previously, they added services on a monthly basis. And this is what uh, changes with cloud computing being in place just from an economic point of view. Now, the cloud animal IT in 2010 and uh, 2010 and beyond, how does it look like for jumping horse? They will have their IT that has always been around. It won't go away. But uh, that IT has to support a hybrid world, that means that has to uh, be able to speak to services out there in the internet. And that means you have to make them cloud or SaaS ready. And at the same time, you do not have to grow them. Uh, once you are more familiar uh, with the cloud and the SaaS world, you can start growing the SaaS portion, the cloud portion of your business, and you can start sh shrinking the highly expensive one-off portion that you have supported for decades. This is uh, the support of the hybrid world. And now, as a result of all of this, this is where a jumping horse uh, will be. They will be another success story in the cloud. And all the three guys will be happy. Hank, uh, because uh, he can run the business as he wants. He doesn't have uh, the huge payouts he had in the past. It's value generated, paid for it, value generated, paid for it. Bill is happy with it. Uh, you know, he's the guy, Bill, who pays the bills. And uh, once value is generated, it's much easier for him to pay out the bills. And last but not least, uh, Frank uh, is happy. Uh, he has enough scars anyway, and so uh, let's hope that he won't uh, have another cloud or or Saskar, and uh, as a result of this, uh, Jumping Horse is going to be a company that uh, lifts this uh, hybrid world and is going to leverage the capabilities that the cloud services will provide to corporates globally. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your questions. No questions? No one? Oh, okay. Just, just a sec. Okay. Um, a question to your answer. I mean, you present on your first slide. So what is your clear answer to your, to your question? Yes or no? Yeah. Cloud <laughs> services, are they ready for takeoff? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, mm, and, uh, I, I don't I like it. I, I will explain it. Yes, uh, they are ready in certain segments. They are ready, you can use them, but you shouldn't believe all the marketing messages. Now, if you have looked into these platforms that are about to emerge, like Microsoft, Azure, uh, IBM's Cloudburst, and so on, the, this is version one point something of it. So I wouldn't put my destiny onto uh, version one point something of 
something. Now, uh, others are ready, and uh, you see it in the CRM, customer relationship management space. Salesforce is a great example of a success. Uh, they have also uh, been able to jump over the threshold of trust. You have to be a really trusted party if customers all over the world store their most valuable piece of data, their customer data, on your service. So that has happened, and so there is, uh, there is uh, cloud services on a, on a very uh, regular basis going live, but uh, let's put it this way, it's the less complicated issues first, and the more complicated ones like ERP, they are going to follow later. Thanks. Is there any more questions? No? No one? Um, so I do actually have another question. Um, you were mentioning uh, the concerns about um, securing data, like personal data, customers' data, and the loss of it as well. Um, however, all of these cloud services do not give you the ability to um, watch, uh, have an eye on your audit logs, basically. So they take the security um, approach of, well, they're updating their systems, of course, themselves, but they don't really give you this update information on which level of security you'd be on. How do you, how do you see this as a concern, apart from now the, the data that is actually stored there, but rather the computing power itself? Yeah. Uh, you, you talk about the availability of... No, no, of I'm not talking about av availability, but about actually securing their servers is something they take completely out of your hand, of course, in their yeah. hand, it's their servers. Um, but you don't really have any logs about this. You don't really have any um, change messages about on which level of security you, you are right now. So how, how up-to-date is their system? Yeah. So uh, this is where uh, Frank uh, has to be on a couple of training sessions just to ask the right questions. That is a, that is a key issue. Is your service secure? Now, uh, service providers tend to compete against each other, and uh, they tend to also compete on price. Uh, we, we have had a couple of examples where uh, the promise was there, it is secure, but the end, uh, the responsibility chain was like this. Uh, I'm the service provider of a SaaS service. I have an agreement with an infrastructural provider who uh, is working with a co-location <coughs> provider who typically is a, is a connectivity uh, telepho uh, telephone-like uh, company. And then uh, this uh, chain of responsibility uh, dilutes uh, the initial intent. That means uh, there, there is procurement in between and there are people who want to make the service cheaper and by the end of the day uh, you may end up not having the level of security you thought uh, you would have and you were given as a promise. Now what happens if, if there is uh, a breach of contract? Yes, you can go after your service provider, but uh, what if uh, the guys uh, in the meantime uh, walked away with confidential data? And the guys means uh, people who are somewhere and who have uh, s services running that you don't want uh, to see run, like uh, we have lost, not we, but uh, us have lost uh, credit card data in Spain over the last several weeks. It's a, it's a huge replacement going on there. And that was a promise given by contract to another provider, another promise given there, and once the chain of responsibility, uh, the chain of responsibility is, is weakest through the weakest link. And this is what uh, Frank and the likes have to really uh, take care of. Uh, the, the good news, however, is uh, if you are in that business of providing these services, then uh, a, an outage of your service and an outage can be a security breach, whatever. 
uh, immediately translates uh, into your business. You can simply not afford uh, to, uh, to make uh, bad compromises there. But it, uh, it needs due diligence and it needs, it needs really frank to have a close look into how the world really works. Thank you. So if nobody has another last question, I would ask a very, very last question. I, I think there was another. Oh, there is one. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, I'm very much concerned about uh, data in the cloud. Uh, if, the, if the service provider or the cloud provider is uh, 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 shutting down his business because it's uh, bankruptcy, so someone else is buying all this uh, hardware and software running in the data center, they have all my data there, and I don't have any legal uh, possibility to, to, to stop this. So the data is maybe not in my country or in, in my region. Yeah. And uh, so I'm very much concerned about this stuff. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that very good question. Uh, that is a key question. You, you give away responsibility to somebody else who says, believe me. Now, it starts with where is the data being stored? We on our side, we, we work uh, in the security end of the market. That means uh, we cannot allow data to be stored in jurisdictions that, uh, yeah, that are difficult. Like in our case, we couldn't have data uh, stored. We run a clearing center, a global one, in the US because the US law says uh, the government has to have access. Therefore, we do that in Switzerland. That's one answer. You have to look at the jurisdiction. Second, uh, what happens if, uh, yeah, if your service provider no longer exists? Then you have to have an agreement in place that gives you this guarantee that you continue to own uh, the data independent of uh, the nature or the status, the situation this business is in. That means uh, there are uh, amendments to contracts uh, that we, for example, do for, uh, for the sort of risk that uh, our customers have. We give them the 100% guarantee that they continue to own the data. You can have some sort of real-time escrow agreement that you do with a, a third party like a notary service. So, uh, but that's an important uh, point and uh, for, for sophisticated things that always have to work, you have to go through exactly these questions and only if you find you can get the right answers, you should do it. Otherwise, don't do it. There will be a service provider who understands the requirements and give you the right exit option. This is an exit option that uh, you need. Thank you, Mr. Kamara, for a very enlightening talk.